Good evening. This is Catherine Lambrecht of the Highland Park Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome Dick Lee, commander of the American Legion Highland Park Post 145, to our annual Pearl Harbor observance, which has long been inspired by the Post. One of the secrets of World War II will be revealed tonight. For 81 years now, generations of Americans have commemorated what Franklin Delano D. Roosevelt called a day that will live in infamy. It was only just recently that the remains of another American sailor who went down with one of the ships that was sunk by the surprise Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor was finally identified adding to the lore that surrounds the momentous event in our history. Most of us older folks are aware that the Imperial Japanese regime at the time was in a pact with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, which made them partners in an aggression against the other countries in Europe, Africa and Asia. Only earlier that year, Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler confided to the Japanese foreign minister that Germany might soon be at war with the Soviet Russia, even though they were technically still allies. At the end of this program, you'll hear an aspect of World War II that most of those who are familiar with much of the history were never aware of before. Please stay tuned. Tonight's program is the journey of Molly's War, Wax and World War Two. Cindy Schaefer, published author of the award-winning Molly's War and editor of the monthly Midwest Writers Association newsletter, collaborated with her 91-year-old mother writing a book based on the letters that her mother sent home to her family while serving as a WAC Women's Army Corps stationed in Europe during World War II. Cynthia received a Bachelor in Sciences in Math Education from Northwestern University and a Master's in, Master of Sciences in Curriculum Development from DePaul University. Her work experience has taken her into three divergent careers. High school math teacher at the inner city of Chicago, IT consultant on the human side of computers writing training manuals and training users, and finally writing a book. We welcome Cindy Schaefer to tell her mother's story tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Welcome to Molly's War. In the introduction to our book, my mother wrote, the war in Europe seemed so distant from our shores until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Each day as I went to work as a medical transcriber at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Dearborn, Michigan, I would look at my coworkers with tears in my eyes, wondering how many of the men would enlist in the service and which of them would return and which of them would not. At that time, I had no idea that in less than two years, I too would enlist. Let's take a moment to remember that day, 81 years ago today, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. And Kathy certainly gave a much longer explanation. I'm excited to be sharing the story of a brave woman who joined the military in World War II. This is my mother's story and the story of women in the military in World War II. There is a quote etched into the World War II Memorial in Washington, DC from Colonel Oveta Kalpavi, the first commanding officer of the WACs, who later became the first secretary of health, education, and welfare. Women who stepped up were measured as citizens of the nation, not as women. This was a people's war and everyone was in it. 
The role of a woman in the military has changed over the years. Today, when you read and hear about women in the military, it is not uncommon for female soldiers to be assigned alongside male soldiers in the combat areas. But it was not always this way. Since 2015, women have expanded their roles and positions in the military. Women graduated from both the Army's Elite Ranger School and the Army's Elite Sniper School. They can enroll in the Navy SEAL program and they have been appointed to four-star general positions. In June 2019, Brigadier General Laura Yeager became the first woman to command a U.S. Army Infantry Division. In July 2020, Jody Daniels was promoted to Lieutenant General, and she became the 34th Chief of the U.S. Army Reserve, the first woman in history to hold this position. During the First World War, women other than nurses were not officially part of the military. Any roles that they served <clears throat> were as volunteers, such as communication specialists or dietitians. but because they were volunteers, they had no official status. The concept of a woman in uniform was difficult for the American public of the 1940s to accept. Uh, my mother is marching, she's in the front row, the woman wearing glasses. However, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the United States entrance into World War II, women's roles began to change. Congress passed a bill on May 14, 1942, to form the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, WAAC. Since they were an auxiliary corps, they did not have the same access to legal benefits and protection as the soldiers in the Army. Because so many men were going to war, it became apparent that women's participation in the war effort was essential. Many women learned new skills in industrial jobs. Hence, Rosie the Riveter. Other women joined the military effort because good clerical and secretarial skills were extremely desirable. The Army discovered an added bonus. One whack typist could replace two men while eating half as much food as one man. <laughs> Once General Eisenhower brought the Auxiliary Corps to North Africa in January 1943, and their efficiency became known, requests for them increased in Europe prior to D-Day. But if these women were being sent overseas, they needed the protection of being part of the army. So in July, 1943, after much debate, another bill was passed in Congress, giving women in the army full military benefits, and they became the WACs, W-A-C, Women's Army Corps. Serving overseas was considered such a privilege that many WACs gave up promotions and more interesting stateside assignments. There were about 150,000 WACs serving in the Army, 20,000 served overseas, and of those, about 8,000 were serving in the European Theater of Operations, and my mother was one of those 8,000. This also included a battalion commanded by Major Charity Adams of 855 African-American WACs who were assigned in February 1945 to the Central Postal Battalion in Birmingham, England. They were responsible for the redirecting of mail to all of the U.S. personnel in the European Theater of Operations. And this included Army, Navy, Marines, civilians, and Red Cross workers, over 7 million people. Their motto, was no male, low morale. When mail could not be delivered to the address on the envelope, it was sent to the postal directory to be redirected. 
They manually updated the information card for each person in this theater. They processed an average of 65,000 pieces of mail during each shift. And at one point, there were 7,500 Robert Smiths. And remember, this was all done without the use of computers. On March 14th, President Biden signed into law a bill awarding the women of the 6th Triple Eight Battalion the Congressional Gold Medal. And at this point, there are very few of them still alive. And this was from an article in the Art Magazine a couple months ago. All of these groundbreaking women who joined the military pave the way for future generations of women in the military. Imagine you are a young woman in the 1940s. The world's involvement in World War II, as well as America's, had been raging on for several years. The media continued with their campaign to urge women into the workforce. Here is a quote from the women's recruiting movement of the 1940s. Never in history has there been such an urgent need for American women to serve their country. This is total war, a war in which every woman, as well as every man, must play a part. My mother, Molly Weinstein, joined the WAC in September 1943 because she thought it was her patriotic duty. Our journey to writing and publishing a book began when my mother enlisted in the WAC. WACs were an essential, for, essential part of the fighting forces in World War II, even though they were not in combat. They handled highly classified material, worked long hours with few days off, and were exposed to a significant amount of danger. Wax assisted in the planning of D-Day and subsequent operations. To meet the European theater's heavy demands for skilled typists and stenographers, recruiting was stepped up. The All States Campaign and the Job Station Campaign. In the first, General Marshall asked state governors to assign committees of prominent citizens the task of recruiting statewide companies for the WAC who would carry their state flags and wear their own state armbands while in training. My mother was from Detroit, Michigan, and this is the armband that she wore. Her family didn't throw anything out, and he's pretending to be Vanna White. The job station campaign allowed recruiters to promise prospective enlistees their choice of duty and assignment location after they completed basic training. My mother had several reasons for enlisting in the WAC. A favorite cousin was killed in the South Pacific in a flying accident early in the war. Two of her girlfriends enlisted, and then she looked around and said, there won't be any men left my age, I might as well join. And at the time, she was 27, which was a lot older than a lot of the women enlisting. At first, when she tried to enlist, she was rejected because of low weight. She weighed less than 100 pounds. In order to enlist, you had to be at least five feet tall, weigh 100 pounds, and have at least 12 teeth. You have to ask your dentist about that one. <laughs> She went home and fattened herself up, and then she was accepted into the WAC and on her way to a new adventure in wartime Europe. My mother wrote extensively to her sister, although wartime military censorship prevented any detailed discussion, and her sister saved this correspondence. My mother was in the medical intelligence section in the Army. Medical intelligence was established by the Army Surgeon General to provide medical and health-related information about the areas in which the Army was preparing to move into so that medical services would be ready for the conditions they would find when the troops arrived. 
And if you look at these letters, you'll see there's um, signatures of the people who had to review her letters. And it sounds like it was usually the higher ranking officers that had to read through everybody's letters before they got mailed out. There was an article about medical intelligence in Collier's Magazine and reprinted in the Reader's Digest in 1943. I was able to locate a copy of that article. My mother's responsibilities included determining the availability of hospital beds for the next military operation and working as a stenographer for a senior medical officer. She took dictation on medical intelligence activities on belligerent nations, handled all secret and confidential material, maintained all files. In summary, medical intelligence was the difference between an army ready for the hospital and an army ready for action. And this was all accomplished without the use of instant access and the internet. They relied on old information from World War I, maps, and local civilian accounts. Molly's War recreates a world that existed more than 75 years ago by taking you through the romantic and always frightful journey of an American whack during the height of World War II. It is not a tale of life on the battlefield, but rather a tale of the battlefield of life and love. This collection of vivid letters recounts my mother's experiences. Molly's story documents the human side of life during the war, a life that alternates between fear and romance, exhaustion and leisure. She was assigned and completed basic training in Daytona Beach, Florida, which was the second training camp for WAX after the Army discovered the harsh winters in Iowa. In Florida, you usually didn't need winter clothes. Then her first assignment was in Wilmington, California, where on the day she arrived, as luck would have it, Warner Brothers Studio was just finishing up a whack recruiting movie and she became an extra. She was actually in two scenes in this film. She was uh, in one scene where she's wearing coveralls and she's talking on a walkie talkie. And the other scene was in a conference room where she's sitting at a table. And now, oh, and also this was the type of film that they would show in movie theaters in World War II before they showed the feature film. And now it's your war too. one of those petticoat soldiers now. Yeah, my sister wants to join the wax. What do you think of that? Huh. She's crazy. What the devil does a woman want to be a soldier for? Just a waste of time. This is a man's war. What sort of jobs can they do? What sort of jobs can we do? Take a look, mister. X-ray technicians, inspectors of army meat, Teachers schooling our soldiers. Wax or classification experts. Assignment interviewers. So this is a man's war, is it? Wax are at work on every sort of army vehicle, doing every sort of motor transport job. Testing walkie-talkies, no. testing radio tubes. Those are just a few of the jobs they do. There are 239 more. Hey, you two armchair generals on the porch, here's something more for you to think about. Listen, General Eisenhower said, in many jobs, wax do the work of two men. The army needs and can use all it can get. And listen to the women of the United Nations. 
They too have some ideas on the subject. The English with their calm courage, the stalwart women of heroic Russia, the Canadian and Australian women, the women of China with their undying fortitude, and tens of thousands of American wax. What are their ideas on the subject? Listen. We shall live up to the legends of our fighting men. Where did these thousands come from? Where will the United States Army get thousands more? Thousands to back up manpower for battle abroad. Who are the women who will help retain the needed manpower for the production battle at home? Who are the women who will help fight our country's war? It's Mary Jones, Jane Doe. It's the idle housewife and the girl next door. Oh yes, it's your war too, Miss and Mrs. America. Here at Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia, one of the most beautiful army posts in the world, we, the newly hatched wax, gather to learn what all the shooting's about. Our kind of shooting. From morning till night, we hustle through a very novel, interesting life. Not just classes and drill and duty, but all kinds of women's sports and recreation. We work hard and play hard. We learn that the Army's privileges as well as its hardships are ours. We get furlough rates on trains, special prices at theaters, special life insurance rates. We know that the rumors about the wax are so much hot air. Scratch that one out. Off duty, rayon, or whatever you can get. You can't use makeup. No lipstick. No nail polish. No lipstick. No nail polish. No lipstick. No nail polish. Toss that one in the ash can. Everybody's hair is alike. The same old hairdo. The same old hairdo. The same Nonsense. Old Our hairdress is up to us as long as it's neat, smart, and off the collar. Mm -hmm. All work and no fun. All work and no fun. Strictly Axis propaganda. From WAC training centers at Fort Oglethorpe and at Des Moines, WACs go forth to army posts, camps, specialist schools, air bases, to every part of the United States. Savannah, St. Louis, Newport, Baton Rouge, Seattle, Santa Barbara. To Washington, our nation's capital, come hundreds of WACs, many to be stationed in the famous Pentagon building and attached to the combined chiefs of staff. Mother, turning her home. Wax are entrusted with tasks involving the utmost secrecy. Here, the important work of decoding messages whose information must be carefully guarded and transcribed with perfect accuracy. At Aberdeen Proving Ground, valuable men have been released for combat duty by Wax. Inspecting mammoth tanks, computing ordnance firing tables for the light, accurate American carbines. The carbines that have canceled the effectiveness of many a Nazi and many a Jap. Here, they also check the efficiency of remote control units and make secret ballistic measurements. These are just a few of the important and interesting jobs done by WAX. At air bases here and overseas, women soldiers perform over 25 technical jobs. War jobs now, but civilian careers later on. We are in the machine shop, in the repair shop. We rig the parachute. We guide our flyers home. Altitude 5,000 feet. Five, zero, zero, zero. Request landing instructions. Mitchell Field Tower to Army 3131. Three, Circle Field twice at 3,000 feet. Let me in, will you? I've got a heavy date tonight. Hmm. Keep your chute on, Lieutenant. Field won't be clear for five minutes. Potential American pilots are taught blind flying by our wax. They are taught to handle night raids over Europe and the Black Pacific taught to navigate safely through black space, loaded with hidden peril. Thousands of WACs volunteer for overseas duty, eager to serve in the actual theater of operation. 
the goal toward which they've worked and trained. Wherever the American armies will go, wax may follow. Women have proven their definite value in England, in North Africa, in Algiers, in New Caledonia, India, and Egypt. Every whack making the war shorter by a month, a week, a day, a minute. Yes, wherever the American armies will go, wax may follow. To Berlin and Tokyo, too. Ladies and gentlemen, General Marshall. The Women's Army Corps is an integral part of the Army of the United States. And its members, who are soldiers in every sense of the word, perform a full military part in this war. There are hundreds of important army jobs which women can perform as effectively as men. In fact, we find that they can do some of these jobs much better than the men. As more and more American soldiers engage the enemy in combat, women must replace them at overseas bases and at posts in this country. In view of the urgency of the situation, enlistment in the military service should take precedence, in my opinion, over any other responsibility except imperative family obligation. In 1918, we were on the sidelines. When the war has been won, the women in the army will march shoulder to shoulder with the men in the great victory parades that will celebrate the return of peace to the world. After her assignment in Wilmington, California, my mother went back home to Detroit on leave. And this is a picture of my mother with her mother and her older sister, Rebecca. And most of her letters were written to her sister, Rebecca. Then she went to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, which was a staging area for WEX going overseas. <clears throat> she was stationed in England before the D-Day invasion began and also while the country was under bombardment by the unmanned German bombs. And my mother is marching in this picture. She is the fourth person. Censorship prevented her from discussing her job, but here is an interesting letter. Yesterday, I went to see Madame Tussaud's famous waxworks. It's amazing how lifelike those figures are. <clears throat> In fact, as I walked in, I started to speak to a girl attendant to ask where we could purchase programs. I was most chagrined when I discovered it was a wax figure. I turned around to see if anyone had noticed my slight error. Then I walked cautiously about and decided not to speak to any of the attendants. You can imagine my further embarrassment when we were about halfway through with the exhibition and started to go on to another floor. I edged up pretty close to a figure at the head of the stairs and stared at it quite frankly. And then he spoke to me. It was a male attendant and I understand he has been fooling the public for about 15 years. Although I can't tell you anything about my job, other than it is medics and is now secretarial, it is most interesting. My, my mother's work continues in London as the preparations for D-Day, June 6, 1944, complete. D-Day was the largest military operation in history that the Allies launched against occupied France on the beaches of Normandy. It is now after D-Day, and the Allies have made great strides into occupied France. 
In retaliation, Hitler's scientists have developed unmanned fantastic flying machines, V-1 rockets, also called buzz bombs or doodle bugs, that were launched by the Germans from somewhere along the French and Dutch coasts with just enough fuel to reach London and then randomly crash land somewhere in the city. London is constantly under attack. When these attacks first began, the wax were frightened and would seek protection in the air raid shelters. But soon they learned that they could wait out the air raids in their apartments. The bombings became a part of their daily routine and they just went on with their lives. Here is the letter that my mother wrote home after Winston Churchill's speech telling the world of the German attacks by the buzz bombs. 26 July, 1944, London, England. Dear Beck, by the way, I wasn't gonna write to say I was in London because I knew you would all worry. And if you promise not to say anything to mom and pop, I will reveal a few interesting items. Restrictions on the doodlebug situation, as far as our mail is concerned, have been lifted somewhat since Churchill's speech. In fact, I could have written a few weeks ago about it, but held off. But now I have gotten to a point where I feel a lot of those people back home <clears throat> who sit back complacently ought to know there is a real war going on. And Beck, I see it every day. The air raid sirens are a frequent sound to us during the day as well as the night. And it means the real thing over here. Those darn buzz bombs come a-floatin' round. They have been our unwelcome visitors both day and night since approximately one week after D-Day. I am sure that many of the people I write to think, because I only write of pleasant things, that there is nothing else that enters into our little lives. I don't believe that the people back home can grasp any part of the situation over here. I, of course, have many incidents to relate, which will have to wait until I see you. However, this one, through the courtesy of the censor, I know you will find interesting. One night after a particularly busy day at the office, I was sleeping most soundly at our billets. It happened to be in the early days of those confounded things. Well, anyway, their roar was terrific, and yet I slept. I noticed a heavy feeling on my head and awoke drowsily to feel my bunkmate holding onto my hand and sitting on my bed. She had placed my helmet on my head, and we both listened for the darn motor to shut off. And fortunately, it didn't land where we expected it to. You can bet your boots we both felt to see if we were wearing our dog tags. Another sight always gives me a peculiar feeling and really penetrates. When I see the busloads of children being evacuated from London to safer places, having separated from family and friends. Taking it all in all, it really is a great experience and certainly makes one appreciate the good old USA more than you can realize. I know you are anxious about me, but don't be, because for some reason, I am most calm about it. Even if I had the opportunity to go home right now, I don't think I would take it. No, not until this war is really over. She was among the first wax to enter Normandy after the D-Day invasion. The wax followed closely behind the fighting forces, slept in the field in tents, on army cots, ate field rations, and took baths in their helmets with cold water. She used her four years of high school French to converse with the civilians and learned about the terrible conditions that they had lived under the German occupation. She actually paid attention in high school, learned and remembered her French. 
She was transferred to Paris a few weeks after it was liberated by the Allies and frequently served as an informal interpreter in both work and social related situations. And here's an excerpt from another letter. Paris, France, 16 September, 1944. Dear Beck, I know that you wonder how I am getting along with the French language. I'm doing wonderfully well. In fact, yesterday I acted as an interpreter. A number of us went to the Arc de Triomphe. We wanted to go up into it and see the view of Paris, but the guard there said we could not at that time as it was closed for the public. Perhaps later, he said. All that in French, and he could not speak a word of English. Then we walked away. We didn't get very far when I heard a shuffling of feet and turned around. There was the guard making a beeline for me with an Air Corps captain in his tow. The captain asked me if I could speak French, and I said a little. He asked me to ask the guard several questions, and I translated the answers. It was great fun, and I understood everything. They were trying to determine whether our pilots had flown any planes under the ark, which was against regulations. Anyway, the answer was no, at least for this guard. My mother enjoyed experiencing French culture because unlike many of the Americans stationed in Paris during the war, she was able to understand enough French to go to French films and theater and to follow the dialogue. She also read the French newspapers and said that it added to her vocabulary. She was still stationed in Paris on VE Day, May 8, 1945, and took part in the revelry of the VE Day celebration. She commented in a letter written after VE Day that it's so wonderful to feel that every plane flying over is friendly. Right after VE Day, my mother wrote home in a letter, frankly, I don't know what the Army will do with us, but please don't think just because VE Day has been declared all I have to do is run out to the docks and grab a boat home. The Army doesn't operate like that. Very soon after VE Day, a new theme appeared in my mother's letters, probably a theme in every soldier's letters, that of the point system. Although there was a point system for discharge, there could be other extenuating factors. Starting in June 1945, my mother wrote that stenos and typists have been declared essential in this theater, whether you have enough points or not. The point system theme continued in her letters home throughout July and August. She was still with medical intelligence and they were the department who reviewed the extensive records that the Nazis left claiming that their experiments were done to enhance medical research. They found that this was not true. After living in Paris, she was transferred to Versailles, where she lived a country life for about a month and even worked in a horse stable. The stable had been converted into offices for the U.S. Army. My mother was always sending French perfume home to her family. Because she was working in a horse stable, her mother wrote to her and said, keep the perfume, you need it. In August, 1945, she was transferred to Germany with the Army of Occupation and witnessed firsthand the devastation of the country. In a letter written from Frankfurt, my mother commented, although the European war has been over for some time, there is a great deal of cleaning up yet to be done. They are still digging through the debris in the bombed buildings. Frankfurt is still quite a mess, even though they say it has been all cleaned up. 
All the bricks have been piled high, so they make a fence around what used to be buildings. In September, my mother writes again about points. So what I wanna bring out is this, I don't have one darn thing to say about it, and I am not kidding. I didn't wanna to go to Germany and just lacked two points. I saw colonels and captains galore. As far as being essential, stenos are no longer in that category. Finally, in early October, Molly gets the word that she will be leaving Frankfurt to go home. After serving with the Army of Occupation, my mother began her trek back to the USA in October 1945. She and other wax took a train from Germany through France. Then they crossed the English Channel and arrived in London. They boarded the Queen Mary on November 3rd in Southampton. The Queen Mary, a luxury ocean liner built in 1936, but put into service in 1942 as a troop ship, was the fastest ship in the world. She was very useful in World War II because she could outrun the German submarines and torpedoes. My mother and her fellow service men and women, 11,000, including 400 female soldiers, set sail on the morning of November 4th. After less than five days at sea, my mother awoke at 2.30 in the morning on November 9th and went on deck to hear Tommy Dorsey and Martha Ray welcoming them home and to see an illuminated Statue of Liberty in the midst of darkness. She knew she was home. I had a suitcase of letters that my mother wrote home. For some reason, her family didn't throw out her stuff. Included in that suitcase were lots of memorabilia, about 350 letters, newspaper articles, and photos, which fortunately my mother had labeled with names, dates, and location. Writing a book based on letters from the 1940s was a formidable task. In order to actually be able to use these letters in a book, I needed to read them and transcribe them, about a thousand pages typed. I also needed to be familiar with the content of the letters so I would have a general idea of what I could edit out for the book. Nobody would want to read a thousand pages of letters. It became a family project as my husband, sister, daughter, and son all helped. My uncle, my mother's younger brother, read the first draft. My mother said she didn't need to read the draft because she was there. Even as I was transcribing the letters, I began going to the Pritzker Military Library in downtown Chicago once or twice a week. Because of censorship, my mother could not write about her work or where she was located. Many letters indicated somewhere in England, somewhere in France. She could only write about pleasant events, sightseeing, and boyfriends. I had to investigate and put historical context around the letters so the book would put proper perspective of the events occurring at that time. Because of the historical nature of the subject matter, the head librarian thought it was important to find a traditional publisher and not to self-publish. A traditional publisher would vet the book and give credence to the accuracy of the information contained in it. In June 2008, she helped me find McFarland Publishers, a leading U.S. publisher of nonfiction books located in North Carolina. They were planning on launching a series of books about women in the military, and they thought my mother's experiences would be excellent to begin their series. But then I didn't hear from them for quite a while. 
I also tried to contact the people who played a prominent role in my mother's life during the war. It was an amazing journey as I connected with some of their people or their children, and we have become email buddies and even Facebook friends. The close friendships that my mother formed with her fellow wax were typical of the experiences of many women serving in the army during the Second World War who found a special camaraderie there. The knowledge that they were serving their country in uniform brought an intensity to everyday life, which helped to forge strong bonds between the wax. Over the years, my mother corresponded with her four closest WAC buddies, sending birthday cards, anniversary cards, and Christmas greetings. But in October 2007, my mother received a letter from Lodo's daughter saying that Lodo had passed away. Lodo was the last of my mother's WAC buddies. This gave me the impetus to begin this project and see it through to the end while my mother was still alive. And my mother was 91, so I knew I was living on borrowed time. I then contacted Lodo's daughter, Kathy, who lives in Hawaii, and we have been in contact ever since. She helped me fill in some of the blanks. When McFarland Publishers finally offered my mother and me a contract in April 2009, I had the book written, 150,000 words. They assigned us an editor from Wales. The publisher wanted at most 110,000 words, so we had some very serious editing to do. We communicated strictly via the internet. Through the miracle of modern technology, I never met my editor nor my publishers, and yet we negotiated a contract, edited, and published an entire book. My mother passed away in April 2012 at the age of 95, but seeing the smile on her face when she held her book in her hand was priceless. Peppered throughout her letters, was the fact that she always wanted to write a book, and it happened only 65 years later. Working with my mother on this project was a very strange experience. It is impossible to know what your parents were like before they became parents. But using my mother's actual letters and photos felt like being transported by time machine to another era. Reading my mother's words and seeing photos of my mother as a young, carefree woman who made decisions for herself and traveled the world during the most treacherous time of all made me realize the full life that she had before she became a wife and mother. I think so many of us never have the opportunity to see our mothers and fathers as well as people separate from the family. The woman in these letters was not the mother that I knew when I was growing up. She was a very different person when she got married and had a family. Sometimes we forget about the role that women played in the Second World War. Women stepped up and were able to make a significant contribution to the war effort, both at home and in the military. These American women showed courage in helping the fighting men, sharing in the disappointments of the soldiers, celebrating their successes, and finally rejoicing in the complete victory. They responded to the challenge and achieved their mission. They also served. With fewer and fewer of these female veterans still alive, this is a story that has its place in the history of women in the military. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Is there anybody here who served in the military? Let's start with that first. I know there's a gentleman who said he was on Utah Beach. <laughs> That's a stretch. Yes. <laughs> It's a good story. That's a good story. It's a really yeah, good story. Uh, I, uh, 
I was uh, drafted in actually in 1959, and uh, so two years, um, and uh, I was assigned to the chemical floor in uh, Dugway, Utah. Uh, Dugway uh, was a chemical warfare proving ground. You may have read about the, the horses that were cast out there. <laughs> they were wild horses. Roaming area, I was uh, fortunate enough to become a clerk typist in the office, the intelligence office. So I didn't suffer too much. Uh, <laughs> because we go into Salt Lake and uh, we uh, have a little more practice there. But uh, it, was a, it was an interesting experience, and I have no regrets about that or even my uh, extra time at Fort Leonard Wood. Going through basic training twice because of something that happened along the way. And uh, uh, I could laugh about it now. I, I wasn't so amused at the time. But uh, I never served in the reserves because I uh, eventually became a, a newspaper reporter and I had odd hours, including weekends. And so I never actually served in the reserves. <laughs> I, uh, I was always interested in the war because that was the only thing I knew until I was nine years old. I knew I thought there was always a war because um, that's what how old I was uh, at uh, DJ Day. I was nine and a half years old and I knew nothing but war, and, uh, and uh, so it stuck with me. And I still have, uh, you know, uh, I always wanted to know more about what really happened, how it happened. And I eventually went back to Europe in 1964 and spent a year in Vienna and uh, working for a correspondent over there. And I, my aim was to find somebody in the, in the, uh, on the other side who uh, had been involved with the war um, and could tell me something about how it all happened. And, uh, on, a, on a train, Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's not. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure no, it's not. He, when you're finished, were there any more questions? I'm, I'm not by Oh, I don't know. Were there other questions? Oh, no, I meant by the chat. Oh, by the chat. Um, there was one question. Let me go back to the chat. Um, did the male soldiers and officers treat your mother respectfully? Were they disdainful? And my mother was always treated respectfully. She never talked about any problems at all. So, and she, what can I say? Well, yeah, I mean, she was, she was in the medical, you know, in medical, so she was, you know, more with, with doctors. Her, her um, commanding officer that she had, he was a doctor, the, the colonel. So she was always with doctors and. Question. Okay, the question was, uh, did she have more boyfriends and was it a fabulous uh, social event for her? Um, other than the bombs that would come down in, uh, in London um, <laughs> and little things like that where she got separated from her friends and ended up spending a night, I think, in the um, Salvation Army and, you know, little things like that are getting... Yeah, no heat and no water in her in the room where she was living. The train, probably. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they used to kind of, whenever anybody was off from work, they would find a place usually in the, um, uh, like the Red Cross, and they would find a bath so that somebody could go and take a bath because there was no hot water. There was, it was cold. They had a lot of problems. But other than that, yes, she had lots and lots of boyfriends. And if you read the book, it was like every time she turned around, she had a different boyfriend. She had so many different proposals. And um, as she was dating one of the people in her office, he was, he was also a sergeant. Um, and she just seemed to have all these different boyfriends. And some of them she continued with you know sending letters and stuff afterwards <laughs> uh, next question is how did she meet my father so before world war ii 
my mother was my mother's from Detroit. My dad's from Chicago, and he had four younger sisters. And my mother was on vacation in South Haven, Michigan. And one of my dad's sisters was on vacation in South Haven. And somehow the two of them got to be good friends. And my dad's sister would send salamis to my mother in Paris. And my my and my my dad was a captain in the army, and he was stationed in the CBI in, in China, Burma, and India. He took supplies across the Himalaya Mountains. So anyway, my mother had all these different boyfriends, all these different proposals, and she just couldn't make up her mind. So she said, I have to go back home to Detroit to think about it. So she was honorably discharged. She went back home to Detroit after spending some time with one of the boyfriends in New York. Um, so she went back home and my dad had a sister who was living in Detroit. And on New Year's Eve, 1945, the sister in Chicago set the two of them up on a blind date. On their second date, my mother said to my dad, for two cents, I'd marry you. Those are the actual two pennies. Like I said, they threw nothing out. He gave her two cents. They got married three weeks after meeting. And they were married for 54 years till my dad passed away in 2000. So I guess when it's right, you know it's right. But she did, she had all these different proposals. She was, every night she was out. <laughs> I forgot, there was like one night where she said she wasn't gonna go out because that was the night she was gonna wash her hair. Uh, <laughs> yes. How much did she weigh? She finally got up to 112. Okay, but what was she before? I think she was like 98. Wow. So she was just under that 200. So she, she under 100, I'm sorry. It was how much did she weigh? Um, so when she went home to fatten herself up, she had milkshakes and all kinds of things that would just bulk, bulk her up. Milkshakes, bananas, whatever. <laughs> so how was the food in Europe? Um, I don't think they just got the food that they got on their base because there really wasn't a lot of food around there. And what would happen is a lot of the, the women, they ended up, you know, like they would get cigarettes and stuff or candy, and then they would trade it with people. Like one of the women went out with a certain guy because he was able to get eggs for them. So it was just, they would do whatever they could to get food. Um, did the editors ever tell you why they wanted you to take so much out of the book? And they wanted a certain size book. And if it had been 150,000 words, then I don't know, it probably would have been another 20 or 30 pages, maybe more. So they wanted it to be a certain size. They also wanted to have some pictures in the book. But we had a lot of say in what they were taking out because there was this one soldier that my mother met when she was in um, Wilmington, California. And he used to call her the whack behind him. And so she you know, met him in Wilmington and then it seemed like she didn't have anything more to do with him. So the, the editor said, well, I'm just gonna take Charles Knotts out of the book, you know, we don't need him in there. And I said, oh no, we do need him in there because every time my mother would get to a place, he was like just a little bit further ahead of her. So um, they did leave him in. In fact, there was one story, he was a combat soldier and he was, um, he was kind of at the Battle of the Bulge. And my mother had heard that if you had a fiance, you could get, he could have a leave and come to Paris and spend time with her in Paris. So she wrote a note to his commanding officer saying, Charles is my fiance and can you, or my fiance, could you um, give him a leave to come to Paris? But of course it was in the, in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge, which my mother didn't know about. So, um, this Charles Knotts write to my mother and say, oh, I wish that were true. I wish it were true. And then he finally um, came to Paris in March and spent a few days with her. Oh, what's the rest of the story? You know, I, when I wrote the book, I couldn't find any real information about Charles Knotts and, and my mother, he wasn't one of the people that she kept up in contact with. So 
couple years ago, when we started doing all the Zoom, there was somebody who was on one of my programs and I was you know, mentioning something. So he gets back to me and he found Charles Knotts on the internet. And based on the date and the length that Charles Knotts was married, he was definitely married when he was in service and saying to my mother, oh, I wish we could you know, get married, but he was already married. <laughs> Which I'm sure there were, I'm sure he wasn't the only one. <laughs> uh, the question is, my mother was Jewish, and what did she see when she yeah. was in, in Europe? And here. Was, and here, was she among the only Jews in the army? I think there were quite a few men that were Jewish. In fact, a good portion of the doctors were Jewish. Um, some questions I just never asked her. About the camps. What about the camps? Well, the camps were completely gone by the time she oh. went to, to um, by the time she went to Germany, the camps were gone. And I'm not even sure how many camps they actually had in Germany. I don't know, but the camps were all gone. But she did talk about, she would go places with, you know, different soldiers and and one time she, they drove up on the top of this like hill and it was all smashed. And she said it was, you know, some kind of a, a lookout site and they could, whoever was there could see everything that was going on. I no, I don't think so. Although there is the story when she was in, in uh, Paris, there's, um, you know, there, there weren't that many women that served. So my mother was always in the newspaper. And there was this columnist on the Detroit Jewish News that would call my mother his overseas correspondent. And back then, when you were in the newspaper, they listed your address, they listed all kinds of information. So one morning, this woman came and knocked on my grandparents' door and said, I noticed that your daughter is, is in Paris with the army. And I think I have a sister living in Paris. Here's the information. Could your sister look up my sister? So my mother took one of her boyfriends and the two of them went to this woman's house and they found the woman. And because my mother could speak French and the boyfriend spoke Yiddish and some German, they were able to get the whole story from this woman. And she was finally safe, but she and her husband and their young son had been hiding from the Germans in, in Paris. And one morning the husband went out to do something and he never came back. And nobody knows what happened to the, to the husband. But my mother did go and visit this woman many more times. And I tried to find the son. And I know that I found him because it was somebody about the right age and just seemed like I found him, but he never answered any of the phone calls or letters or anything that we sent. So, I don't know. And then another story, um, after, uh, when she was with the Army of Occupation, she was in Frankfurt, Germany for um, Rosh Hashanah, uh, 1945. And she went to the only standing synagogue in, um, in Germany, in, in, and the only standing synagogue in Frankfurt. And the only reason the synagogue was standing is because um, it was right near the Nazi headquarters and they didn't want to risk doing something to their own building. So she went to the synagogue and she said that um, it was, you know, well attended by the army personnel, but very few Jews from the 34,000 Jews that lived in, in Frankfurt. And she said that the, the Germans like hung out the windows watching the people walk into the synagogue, but they didn't say anything. Um, a very interesting note, several years ago, I was speaking at uh, Winston Towers in Chicago, and there was a, a man who raised his hand and he said, I'm a Holocaust survivor, and I was at that rededication. And I remember seeing all the wax there, and I didn't know why they were why they were all there. 
Um, the question is, I thought women in service were encouraged to return to becoming homemakers after the war to make way for men who needed jobs when they returned. Did your mother speak to this? Um, you know, when you see that film where it says, oh, these are gonna be careers for women, that wasn't the idea necessarily because when all the men came back, yes, they needed jobs. Um, my mother always worked. Once she, she had three children and once my brother was in school full time, my mother went back to work. Um, she was always in a, a medical field. She always would say, you can't just be a secretary, you have to be a specific kind of secretary. So before the war, she was a medical transcriber at the Veterans Hospital in Dearborn, Michigan. During the war, she was in medical intelligence. And afterwards, she was a medical secretary at Garfield Park Hospital and then at Edgewater Hospital. My mother always felt that women should be able to do whatever they want to do. And my mother actually, had, her sister was an attorney back in the day when there weren't that many women attorneys. Comments? It's not a good job to solve the riddle of these mothers having to do. Oh, okay. Any other questions? I do have lots of memorabilia and I have books and they're $20. You don't mind if I borrow the microphone? This was great, Cindy. Thank you. And you got lots of compliments online and there'll be more as time evolves. You know, okay. Yes. All right. Okay, now, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to go to Jeff Stern. Tell us. Well, of course, uh, Jeff uh, here. Pearl Harbor commemoration. And one of the interesting things that I learned about the war was that uh, although Japan was part of the triumvirate of uh, Axis powers, uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan, and theoretically had a pact among them uh, regarding what they were doing with the in the war or how they were going to cooperate. The interesting part is that uh, in uh, March of 1941, uh, the Japanese foreign minister was visiting Hitler, and at that time, Hitler said to this Japanese foreign minister that he should not go back to his emperor and uh, tell him that. Uh, Everything was uh, uh, going smoothly between Germany and the Soviet Union because uh, he said, Don't be surprised if uh, we had conflict with Soviet Russia. Even though at the time Germany ostensibly had a pact with the Soviet Union, that's how the war started in a way because. They both agreed secretly to invade Poland, carve it up with Britain, and not to attack each other. So, although Hitler expressed that thought to the Japanese uh, foreign secretary, the opposite did not happen. The Japanese never told the Germans that they were planning to attack American soil and start a war uh, with America. It was a complete surprise to the Germans. And uh, uh, ironically, because of Hitler's megalomania or whatever you want to call it, when that happened, he, Hitler, decided to declare war on the United States after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Even though they could have stayed out of it very easily, and it would have been difficult for us to have an excuse to attack and to engage in the war with Europe because the Germans had an attack, it was the Japanese. But uh, Hitler gave us the excuse to declare war on him because he declared war on us uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But the Germans were told about it in advance. Okay, where did you get your insider information? I 
do know the answer to this question. We should say that came from a very Thank you. Thank you. She's fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to buy a book. <laughs>